Hello, and thank you to everyone for joining us today in the second of Association of Moving Image Archivists webinars. Um, there has been no audio yet. We are starting right now at the top of the hour. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. Um, I know that folks are joining us on the West Coast across the United States as well as in Europe. So um, we will also have these webinars available after today's live session. Uh, the recordings will be available, and we will be sharing information with you all about how to access those. Um, before we get started, I wanted to make sure that everyone can hear me. So um, please raise your hand within the GoToTraining control panel if you can hear me loud and clear. You have all joined in listen-only mode due to the number of registrants we have today. Uh, on the left-hand side of the control panel, uh, in GoToTraining, you should see some icons, or uh, and one of which is uh, a hand. So if you can raise your hand, um, just so we can ensure that the audio is coming out loud and clear to you all. Um, there is also, I want to point out to you, a chat window available. Uh, you can communicate with uh, me. Uh, I am the producer of today's webinar. Uh, my name is Kimberly Tarr, and I'm talking to you from New York University. Uh, we also have uh, our presenter uh, on the line, who I will introduce to you in just a moment. The chat window enables you to communicate with the entire audience or with just the organizers of the event. So if you can take a moment now to familiarize yourself with the interface, the primary way in which we will hear you today is through that chat window. So if you can uh, take a look at that now. Uh, I want to officially welcome you all to the second webinar in the Introduction to Digital Formats and Storage series. The webinars were developed and produced by the EMEA Online Continuing Education Task Force. Um, I'm going to also just provide some logistical information to you to assist those of you who are less familiar with GoToTraining, um, this interface. So the chat box should be at the bottom of the control panel. Thanks for folks who are um, letting me know that they can hear me, both via their hands up and also through the chat window. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the session, either about the interface or content related, you can send them uh, to the organizers or to the entire group through the chat window. Um, I will be fielding questions and assisting our instructor today in making sure that we have a chance to get to all of your questions and comments. Uh, if we don't address your, your question immediately, we'll ensure that we have time carved at the end of our 90-minute session to make sure that we tackle it. Um, at this point, you should also be able to see the first slide in what will be Marcos' uh, presentation. Um, we will be advancing through this presentation in a screen share mode, so you will just see the slides advance. Additionally, you can access the materials. Um, uh, you can access the materials through the materials tab on GoToTraining's control panel. So if you all want to just take a look and identify where that is, there are two. Um, I, I'm sorry, I got it distracted here. It seems as if folks can, um, some people can hear me and some cannot. So um, I'm going to continue and make sure we can get everybody on the phone So um, and on the line. Okay, the materials tab, there are, are two documents that you can access, and the first of which is the presentation PDF that you can save and refer to in the future. We also have a participant uh, frequently asked questions that you might have um, some questions regarding the GoToTraining interface or the EMEA webinars generally. So um, I'm going to, at this point, um, let's see, um, just let everybody know that there is, there is both a call-in number and you can access the call via voice over IP. So, um, great. Uh, 
now I would like to uh, introduce our instructor today for our session on digital audio formats. So we're very lucky to be joined by Marco Suero Ball, who is the senior archivist at New York Public Radio, a native of Spain. Marcos has worked with collections at the Alan Lomax Archives, Columbia University, and Emory University. In 2012, he was part of the task force that drafted the National Recording Preservation Plan. And in 2011, he co-translated the definitive text on audio preservation, EASA's PC-04. As an audio engineer, Marcos has mastered and restored the eight CD set of Jackie Kennedy Conversations published by Hyperion, and was nominated for a 2008 Grammy for his work on the CD, Hulk Miller and his Old South Quartet. I am delighted to uh, welcome Marcos uh, to our session today. And, um, and if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, please just uh, let us know via the chat window. So I'll be addressing some of those questions that have popped up so far. But Marcos, I will turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks, Kim. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, very excited to be here. I want to thank uh, Amia for giving me the opportunity to uh, present a little introduction to uh, digital audio and what it's all about and what kind of things we can encounter. I also want to thank Alex Crow and Dave Walker of the University of Georgia and the Folk Life Center, respectively, um, for their help preparing actually this webinar and, and the next one. So it's been, it's been exciting and it's been fun. It's been uh, a bit of work, but it's been great. Uh, sometimes the, the things that are more basic are the ones that are um, more complicated in a way. So, but hopefully you'll uh, leave today with a good sense of, um, of what this is all about. All right. So. Um, the overview of um, what we're going to do today is um, as follows. We're going to talk about the digital audio basics. We're going to talk about carriers. We're going to talk about encoding. And we're going to talk about metadata. The way I like to uh, approach this is um, a bit as, as an onion, if you will, with several layers. And also the way many of us who have been in archiving uh, for a while the way you look at, um, you may encounter a new collection is sometimes you enter a room that a donor may have uh, uh, given you access to and there's boxes and there's uh, things within the boxes and then there's material within those uh, things in those boxes. So a bit of a, an, an onion um, uh, approach, a layered approach. And that works both uh, in the physical world when you enter a room or in the, in the more um, virtual world that we uh, many times live in now, as digital archivists, that you may be given a hard drive and there's um, layers within layers. So um, that's how we're going to approach it. And by the way, I should mention that I'm, I'm calling in from my hometown in Spain. So it's a little uh, later. I'm looking at a beautiful sunset. And I'm not actually that far from the Mediterranean Sea. I'm about 20 minutes from the Mediterranean Sea. And I want you to start thinking about uh, the tides in the Mediterranean Sea and, and the waves. Not because I want to make you jealous particularly, although it is beautiful, but uh, it may come in handy later. So um, let's talk about, about uh, some of these things that, we're, that we've mentioned. Um, in terms of digital audio basics, we're going to talk about audio recording and, of course, audio playback. And uh, along the whole talk, and, and especially in, in this section, We'll try to answer questions such as what is digital audio, what makes it digital, what is different uh, about digital audio versus, um, versus analog. Then again, think of the onions. What do formats look like? Uh, what kind of objects may you encounter, be they um, physical or uh, virtual? How do they work? What makes them tick? Uh, no pun intended, and audio timing is sometimes uh, everything. And uh, what are their archival issues? We're librarians and archivists, uh, most of us, so we want to know what kind of issues we may encounter. Um, in terms of carriers, we're going to talk about physical carriers, things that you can uh, hold in your hand with care, and uh, file-based carriers. And we'll talk about the differences, how sometimes those differences, I 
sometimes hard to um, to pinpoint, but uh, that's kind of how they work, and it, it's a useful distinction. And uh, and then within those carriers, how can maybe we classify them? We'll see that there's basically three types of physical uh, carriers for digital audio, and uh, many types for file-based audio. Then moving on, we'll talk about encoding, and that will necessarily uh, cover theory of sampling and codecs. Um, what we're trying to answer in that section is uh, how is audio encoded as, as discrete values. Um, that's what, um, I don't want to give it away, but that's basically what makes digital audio different from, from other kinds. And, uh, and how is it codified? How, how is it stored as, as values? And then finally, again, thinking of layers, um, metadata is sometimes, unfortunately, not always, but sometimes it's the most buried aspect of, um, of digital audio, particularly when it's embedded. But we're going to look at both physical carriers, uh, metadata, and file-based uh, carriers uh, and their associated metadata. So uh, metadata is, of course, uh, data about data. It's sometimes necessary to actually even play back um, whatever you want to hear uh, correctly and uh, or to play be played back at all so it'll be an important section as well so again digital audio basics carriers encoding metadata uh, again if you have any questions about the content I cannot help you with the uh, technical issues unfortunately but um, if you have questions about the content, feel free to interrupt me via the, the chat uh, window, and I'll try to answer your questions. I may not get to it right away if I know that I'm going to answer it uh, later, but uh, feel free to, to in interrupt me virtually. All right. So digital audio basics. How is digital sound recorded? Well, this is how it goes. A vibrating object creates variations in air pressure which are transformed into variations in voltage, which in turn are stored as discrete values in a carrier. Let's look at this uh, a little more in detail. Uh, you probably remember from your high school physics class that a uh, vibrating object uh, moves back and forth and creates uh, compressions or rarefactions of, uh, in the air or the medium that's, uh, in which that object is embedded. Most of the time, that medium is air. So say a bell vibrates back and forth and it's pushing the molecules and sort of stretching the molecules of air around it back and forth. So literally the air pressure around, um, around that bell is changing minutely compared to the, the overall air pressure but uh, strong enough for our ears. And not the air itself but the, the pressure uh, values change over time and they're, and they're transmitted through space, through that medium, through the air. And if you were to plot those variations, you would see that they go back and forth, uh, up and down from, a, from an equilibrium. So those variations in air pressure are then, when you want to record them, transform into variations in voltage via what's called a transducer. Most of the time, a transducer is a microphone. Uh, and a transducer, all it is, is transforms one type of energy into another. So in this case, the air pressure is transformed into uh, variations in voltage. Those variations in voltage, I put this little wavy sign because they look analogous, they look very similar to the variations in the air pressure, which in turn also look very similar to the way that belt was vibrating back and forth. And uh, those variations in voltage are then stored as discrete values, as numbers. That's what makes digital audio unique. And that was a development that only came about um, in the 40s and 50s in a very primitive fashion and then uh, kind of took off in the 1980s. And of course, those discrete values have to be stored in a, in a carrier. So steps A through C are in the analog domain and may even be omitted in some cases. Um, so all of that, the bell, the air pressure, the variation of the voltage kind of live in the, in the real world, in the physical world. And they're, um, again, analogous. That's what's called in the analog domain. They all look very similar. Their values are similar. They're continuous 
um, and they, they look very similar when you plot their values over time. Um, but then there's, again, what makes digital sound digital. They're stored as discrete values, and we're going to look a little more in detail as to well, how that is done. But suffice to say for now that there are many steps between the voltage fluctuations as a smooth curve and the zeros and ones, they eventually become zeros and ones. Um, but right now we will not concern ourselves too much with it. Let's just say that a typical PCM encoder, and that stands for pulse code modulation, uh, discrete values, someone asks me, discrete values are numbers, basically. They're not um, a smooth line, but think about it as, as uh, values that are separate from each other. So the zero is separate from the one, the one is separate from the zero. In this case, I have zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, right? So that's different than a line that's continuous, okay? It'll make a little more sense as we go along. But um, so a typical PCM encoder, which stands for pulse code modulation, and which we will look at it more in detail later, uh, may have the following circuits. And don't get scared, but I just uh, I will mention them. Things like input amplifiers, input low pass filters, sample and hold circuits, A to D converters, a multiplexer, a digital processing modulation circuits, and, and error, including error correction, and then some kind of uh, short term storage media. So um, someone asked me how is analog audio recorded. We're not going to get too much into that. Let's just say those variations in voltage are stored. Uh, as continues, as continues uh, uh, values, as opposed to separate values. I hope that makes sense, and I think it'll make a little more sense when we go a little deeper. But feel free to keep asking me questions. So, um, of course, those discrete values have to be stored in a carrier, and that is something that I'm, I'm going to emphasize because sometimes when we talk about the virtual world or file-based audio. Uh, we, we forget that it still needs a carrier and they still need a place, a receptacle, if you will, to uh, store those values. Okay, so that's how digital sound recording uh, works. Those of us in um, libraries and archives and in preservation know that preservation without access makes no sense, right? We've been hammered that uh, concept uh, many times and it makes sense. So equally, digital sound recording without playback is kind of nonsensical, right? So we need something to, to play back. And essentially this is the process in, that, that occurs when you play back digital sound. Software within a device interprets data inside a carrier and outputs variations in voltage continuous variations in voltage which are transformed into variations in air pressure. So um, again, let's take a look at that uh, process a little more in detail. Uh, software is just a set of instructions. So it's kind of like uh, how you know the English language. I hope you know English language or else <laughs> we're, uh, we may be wasting, you may be wasting your time. Um, that's how you interpret the data that is given to you, right? So there's a software, there's a set of instructions that are certain previous knowledge that lives within a device. That previous knowledge interprets a data set that is um, encoded in a carrier. So somehow that data is interpreted by the software within the device and hopefully that software knows what to do and outputs variations in voltage which are then transformed via various processes eventually into variations in air pressure and hopefully those variations in air pressure um, reach your ears and they sound a lot like the bell that we recorded originally. And of course the process is, is quite a bit complicated and, and it's kind of an amazing engineering feat. Just like we talked about uh, this steps that are in the digital domain, the last two steps in this case are in the analog domain we're not going to focus too much uh, on them. Um, so, uh, but suffice to say that, that we're going to focus on the first four steps. The software within a device interprets data within, in, 
it's had a carrier. Um, here is the process in chart form, audio playback. Again, there's data within a carrier. That data somehow is transferred uh, to a device or is uh, presented to a device. The device includes some kind of software. It reads that data and outputs analog and uh, digital streams of audio. For example, uh, something like uh, a DAT head, which we'll talk about later, digital audio tape. So a rotary head system such as a DAT may have audio encoded as linear PCM. It certainly will, in fact. And, um, and we'll talk about more about that later. And then what is physically inserted into the proper deck, there's a head, there's a rotary head that reads the magnetic um, uh, pulses as data. And, uh, and that data then is transferred to, to the demodulator and other software within the deck. And um, the deck software then, uh, including sample and whole circuits and many other circuits that we mentioned earlier, interprets that data and outputs it as a stream of analog and digital audio. Incidentally, in a system uh, like that tape, which, um, which is what's called a physical based uh, uh, digital audio, the red arrow for the rotary head and the uh, uh, blue arrow uh, of the analog uh, stream is they go at about the same pace. They, they move at about the same speed. And we'll talk more about that later. Now here's with something that's um, a little more modern. You may have an M MP3 file within your hard drive in your computer. That audio in that MP3 file will be encoded as an MPEG layer 3, which is actually the way it's, the audio is encoded. And the, your hard drive is connected to your computer's PCU, uh, CPU and RAM via a connector, this, a common connector, EIDE probably in your computer and that data is uh, usually stored as, as RAM um, and then there's software like iTunes that reads that data and says oh I know what to do with this and you can um, the computer can then output analog and digital uh, streams. Uh, software like iTunes is incredibly complex there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, parts of iTunes including the decoder specifically for MP3 has decoders for others. It can read certain types of metadata. It has a lot of, uh, of uh, aspects to it. But in this case, uh, the connection, the EIDE connection that you see here, and I can't remember what it stands for, uh, is much faster than the blue connect, like, uh, connection, the blue stream. The red stream in this case is much faster as opposed to the that tape that we, that we mentioned earlier. And um, and that will make a difference, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, that later. In a way, the computer gulps it down, the RAM, uh, random access memory, gulps it down and then spits it at the proper speed. Whereas before, it's kind of like a stream, a flowing stream uh, from the tape out to the output of the deck. And that's a good segue to talk about our big um, kind of divide of uh, physical versus file-based digital audio. Um, these are the differences that uh, are exist between what we call physical digital audio and file-based digital audio. Uh, data within digital formats is usually stored as a stream to the device in real time, okay? so. It's what's called synchronous playback. Uh, it usually is designed for standalone players. And the players read the data, if it's from tape, for example, or from disk, uh, as a stream and it outputs it, kind of like carries it along. There's some processes, of course, because the data needs to be interpreted and outputs it as audio. Classic example of physical um, data. Uh, digital audio format is uh, CDDA, CD digital audio, in other words, uh, the audio, the, the CDs that we're, most of us I think are familiar with, maybe the youngest among us uh, may not be, uh, or digital audio tape. So these are, again, data that 
where the, the stream of audio is, is designed to be uh, continuous uh, and synchronous all at the same time. Whereas uh, file-based, aka born digital, such as WAVE or MP3 files, usually are stored as a file and accessed as a file. Again, the computer kind of gulps it and then spits it when it's necessary. And usually requires a computer plus specialized software. And it usually includes an extra layer, a wrapper, a file. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, for example, uh, there's WAV files, there are AUG Vorbis files. And this, um, this kind of makes a difference in, uh, in conceptually in how, how the whole thing works. Um, people call it born digital. I find that uh, term a little misleading, or quite misleading, in fact, because uh, a DAT recording is very much born digital. There's nothing more digital about an uh, MP3 file than a DAT recording. The term has kind of stuck, so um, we, we kind of accept it, but keep in mind that there's nothing more born digital on a file-based uh, system than in a physical uh, system. There are certain um, implications when something is file-based as opposed to needing to be accessed um, as, as, a, as a stream. The biggest one of them is that it can be uh, transferred as a file uh, in, much, in a much faster way and in a kind of a much easier way. And, um, and that makes it much easier to uh, replicate, for example. If you want to copy a DAT, you'll have to play it pretty much, unless you use some trickery, pretty much at in real time. So if, the, if you recorded two hours on a, on a digital audio tape, you'll have to spend two hours transferring. It's kind of similar to the analog world uh, for the most part. And uh, whereas if you want to copy an MP3 or a WAV file, as you know, it can be much faster, right? And uh, for example, when I um, uh, brought some MP3s from the States here to, to Spain, I, I grab a flash drive and I put, you know, hours and hours and hours of MP3 files, but I, I, the copying took minutes, right? And well, when I play it back, of course, I need to play it back at the right speed. So there's implications. And one of the implications, of course, is when you, when you copy something so easily is that uh, management can be a little complicated. And that's, as all digital archivists know, and I think we all are digital archivists at this point, um, we, uh, we, it's, it's harder to manage sometimes because they're so easy to copy. Someone asks me what a wrapper is. So a wrapper is uh, basically a file. Uh, the file has an extra layer that tells you, okay, this is what this type of file is. And then there's an extra layer within the wrapper that says um, the, 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 the wrapper generally accepts certain types of encoding of the, of the audio. So for example, a wrapper like a WAV file will be, um, will be read by a computer. And then within that WAV file, the, the audio will be encoded um, in a certain way. Uh, it can be linear PCM. It can be uh, using MPEG layer three, usually linear PCM, but it's kind of like it's. Think of it as if you think of the physical world, you have a um, a videotape, right? So videotape is the physical equivalent of a wrapper in the virtual world. A videotape can have um, a VHS tape, can have video, or actually can have audio, as we'll learn later. So it's kind of like the overall look, what the computer sees uh, is, is the wrapper. I hope that, that makes sense. It, I think it may make a little more sense when you look at it later. But it's basically the, the file format that that, that uh, audio is, in, is wrapped in, right? The carrier, if you will. Now that I've explained this, I will tell you the looks can be deceiving. I just mentioned the video uh, cassettes can have audio and no video at all. And there's things like uh, DDP uh, files, which stands for Disk Description Protocol, pretty rare, pretty obscure. It's used for mastering. 
but the files in, inside live in computers, but they're not, they're kind of not designed to be played asynchronously. They're designed to describe a compact disk, which will then be played um, synchronously, actually, so in real time. And of course, you can have a compact disk, a CDR, that has an MP3. It has a bunch of files and MP3s. In fact, CDR, as, as many of you know, can have, uh, you know, Word documents. So something that looks like an audio format, and it was in fact developed as an audio format, can have something that is completely different. So the physical versus file based is useful most of the time, but you should be aware that loops can be deceiving. And when you enter a, a, a room that has a bunch of CDRs, uh, you shouldn't assume that those are audio CDs. They may have a bunch of other things. Most of us know that, but I think it's, it, it bears um, uh, emphasizing that this can, be, um, this can be different. And also, again, I will say that file-based audio still needs a physical support. For example, we love to talk about the cloud. Yes, the cloud is, 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 looks virtual, and it looks virtual on our screens but it's still a bunch of spinning uh, magnetic disks, uh, probably somewhere in South Dakota or somewhere. Um, but it's, it's important to know that. So let's, let's not um, forget that, that aspect of it. OK, so that's it for uh, um, the division between physical and uh, file-based carriers. I'm going to talk now about physical carriers. Physical carriers can be. Um, one of three types. These are the three types of carriers in which you may find digital audio. Okay, Magnetic, optical, or flash media. Um, we will focus on this talk on the more audio specific physical carriers. Again, keeping in mind those caveats, but um, I think it makes sense uh, to focus on those carriers that, is, that were kind of developed or that were prevalent in the audio, digital audio physical world. Um, in the analog world, there's uh, slightly different types of carriers. There's uh, mechanical, magnetic, and optical. And uh, you could say that CDs are actually a bit mechanical because there's physical indentations in the CDs that, inter uh, that represent the data that we want to uh, read. But uh, they're really optical media. They're, they're considered optical media because they're read by a laser, as we, will, as we will learn. So yeah, magnetic media, optical media, and flash media are the three types in which you may find um, digital audio. Magnetic media is, is generally divided into two major types tape and disc. Uh, tape is basically a thin strip of plastic, uh, often but not always in, in an enclosure, so kind of like a, a cartridge or a cassette. And uh, it uses heads to read that, uh, those magnetic impressions uh, of the medium. Um, discs are basically a rotating flat circular device uh, that includes an arm uh, much like a turntable, the old turntables, and the arm, instead of having a stylus, it has uh, an electromagnetic head. Heads are basically electromagnets that read the, um, the transducers, in fact. They read the magnetic um, uh, imprints, if you will, on those on the media and outputs uh, electric, uh, electric um, impulses, but still in the digital realm. Hope that makes sense. So magnetic media is divided into tape and disc. Further, tapes are generally uh, divided, tape systems are usually divided into rotary head and stationary head. Uh, among rotary head, uh, the, the earlier ones, the earliest ones for digital audio are the VTR-based formats. In other words, devices that literally used uh, video cassette recorders to record audio. So I gave you a little taste of that earlier. And some of the popular ones are F1, the PCM1600, both of which are Sony, and the DBX700. F1 particularly is uh, as popular, is, it was quite popular in fact, and it was kind of a surprise for Sony and that's why they developed that. But um, F1 uses beta tapes, like literally 
basically um, the same exact tapes as, as you would use for beta. You can also use VHS. Normally you find beta tapes of F1 recordings because beta is better, folks. Uh, PCM1600 used U-Matic and it was used for many years uh, professionally to actually master uh, compact discs. DBX700 is kind of an odd format. We have some of the station uh, it used a different type of recording of encoding, so it doesn't use linear PCM and uh, it uses VHS tapes for the most part. Actually, I think it can only use VHS tapes. Um, so those are the VTR, VTR based formats, the, kind of the, the, the early history of, of, um, of digital recording. And then you have uh, that digital audio tapes, which we will be focusing on a little later. AKA rotary RDAT, which stands for RDAT, uh, rotary head DAT. So um, we'll talk a little more about that. Actually, I'm not going to talk about it. I was tempted, but I'm not going to. And then there's um, things like DTRS and ADAT. DTRS is sometimes called the TASCAM format. Those are multi track formats. What I mean by multi track is that instead of uh, two channels left and right, which correspond to, say, your headphones on your iPod or whatever. There's many channels you may record, say, uh, if it's a rock band, so the, the kick drum and the snare and the bass and the cymbal and the hi-hat in separate tracks that then are mixed together to put together a, a final recording. So these are kind of early in the production. And archives generally don't have these formats, but um, unless they're part of, of, uh, of a recording studio. So. Um, but it's, it's good to be aware of them. They were very popular among uh, music, for example, yeah, not necessarily recording studio musicians also used ADAT quite a bit because it was a format that was much more portable with very high quality. Um, and then, so those are the rotary heads, these three types, and there's the stationary heads, which are much more rare, and I'll mention two, DASH, which stands for, I think, Digital Audio Stationary Head, and in those, uh, the head doesn't move, doesn't rotate, and an odd one, there was a consumer format actually. Oh, Dash, sorry, I forgot to mention Dash is a multi track format too. So for studios, very expensive, uh, very fancy, and from what I hear, very problematic. Uh, DCC stands for Digital Compact Cassette. It was kind of an odd hybrid format that tried to um, take over the mini disc market. It was an utter failure. I kind of have a soft spot for it because it was trying to bridge the analog world with the digital world. It used uh, audio cassettes, the, the Philips compact cassette, for those who remember that, uh, as a carrier with slightly different formulation, if I recall correctly, on the, on the oxide. So you could have more density, more data density. But the decks could play analog and digital cassettes. So uh, you have one of those. Uh, keep it as a museum piece because it definitely will be uh, an odd um, an odd format. So those are the, tape, the types of tape, and tape again is type of magnetic medium. DA88s indeed are the devices that read the DTRS format, but not only DA, DA88 is, uh, for those who don't know, it's a Tascam uh, type, it's a Tascam uh, uh, model, but there are others, I think, uh, I think Denon may have, used, may have made uh, decks that were DTRS as well, but yes, those are. Um, okay, so we have tape and disc. As I said, a magnetic disc is a rotating flat circular device with an arm and head. We're not going to uh, focus on these because uh, they're kind of agnostic um, type of, of, of uh, medium, of physical medium. Uh, of course, the most common one are hard disks which if you're sitting at a computer, which you are, uh, you will have at least one. And then if you have been around for a while, you may remember jazz and zip disks. You may remember floppy disks. There, there were others. Um, yes, you can find audio and um, in those kind of devices. But again, this is why we uh, divide things into file-based and, and, and uh, physical-based because they're so um, so agnostic because you can store so many different types of uh, data 
in hard disk and jazz disk and floppy disks. Uh, we're not going to focus too much on them because you can find a lot of information on these. And there's a good chance if you have a zip disk, there will be zero audio in, in that disk. It could also happen on a hard disk, um, and it could also happen on a floppy disk. So um, we're not going to talk too much about magnetic disks. But again, I will say that uh, when you have a digital audio, these days you'll probably find it in a hard disk. And those are physical items. I like to stress that. Maybe, um, maybe too much. So stop me by maybe stop me if you've heard that one before. Okay, so that takes care of magnetic media. Uh, when we go into detail a little more on physical carriers, we'll talk about that because that's kind of like the the um, standard bearer for audio, digital audio in, on magnetic media. And um, now we're going to talk about optical media a little bit. We'll talk about CD based, uh, CD uh, DVD based, and others and finally mini disc and other magneto optical disks. Uh, again, I'm going to focus on uh, the archetypal uh, optical medium, which is the compact disc. This is how people in the vast majority of the world first heard digital audio from a CD bought in a store. And uh, it's kind of like the, the archetypal digital audio uh, system. and. Uh, DVD, yes, there's something called DVD audio, and there's others as well. Uh, I think Blu-ray even has a, a specific uh, definition. I'm not sure about that. and um, But we're not going to focus uh, on that too much because the odds that you'll find audio on a DVD are kind of small, um, DVD audio. It's kind of a, its own thing. And then finally, mini-disc, another mini magneto-optical discs. Um, Someone asked me, why is the term optical? Excellent question. It's called optical because the data is read by lasers. Um, uh, crazy as it sounds. Um, in both CDs, DVDs, and all of these actually, CD, DVD, and Minidisc all are read by, a, by optical uh, means. Um, and we'll see how that works a little later. So let's move on. And then finally, we have magnetic media, optical media, and then we have flash media. Flash media uses a totally different system from the other two. Uh, some examples are memory sticks, SD cards, USB thumb drives in which, as I said, I brought a bunch of um, MP3s. Very similar to what we said about um, hard disks. Uh, if they have audio, it will be file-based audio. So it's kind of not particularly uh, useful to think of them as audio carriers, but they can be as physical carriers. They can have audio. Um, flash media uses a totally different way of storing. Uh, it basically uses chips, and chips are a bunch of transistors put together. So they use certain properties um, and logical gates to store their information as zeros and ones, basically. Um, but again, these are very agnostic. Uh, devices. So, yes, you can find um, audio. Yes, if you have only your audio in a USB thumb drive, it's probably not a good idea because it can be uh, crushed or, or or whatever. You can lose it. But um, there's also a good chance that you'll have, you know, photos or word documents or, or whatever. Uh, so again, they're very agnostic. So in fact, we're not going to talk about flash media at all after this, unless you are really interested. Um, but I, I don't know that much about it, frankly. So these are the two that I'm going to focus on. From magnetic media, that, which is a type of tape, and from optical media, CDDA, which stands for CD, digital audio, the original spec for compact disc, and uh, the mini disc. So these are the formats that epitomize digital audio as a physical carrier. Magnetic tape, that, digital audio tape, was announced in August 1986. Uh, it uses rotary heads which um, imprint a helical scan. What that means is that there's a rotating head, much, much like a VCR, that um, 
records the information in bands, not as the tape travels. Um, so you see the photo there. Um, there's two basically reels and the, the tape, two spools, and the tape travels along um, the the container. And there's a rotary head that reads the data, but as as bands, not as the not as the tape moves, but as bands. And this allows to have much higher what's called data density. You can store many more things in that same um, real estate. And the real estate is very small, as you can see. Uh, it's a kind of miniature uh, videotape. And the system, in fact, is, is that. It's basically a tiny videotape with an additional uh, device that used to be uh, a part in those early VTR systems. You would use a VCR with a separate machine that would transform um, the analog audio into digital stream. So that is all into one enclosure for digital audio tape. Uh, it was very popular in professional circles when it arrived because it was much smaller and, um, and, the, and the audio quality was, was really terrific for the, for the size. Price was, of course, very high at the beginning, but then it, it changed. It's important to know that it has various resolutions, and we'll talk about resolutions a little later. But the quality is not necessarily uniform on that. Sometimes if you wanted to uh, store more data, you could go to lower quality um, and, and record more, more data within the same uh, uh, tape. And also of interest to us archivists, it is known for compatibility issues. What that means is that um, and this was from the get-go, actually, if you recorded your audio, um, if you get, if you record your audio on, um, on a say on a Sony deck, and you try to play it back on a Tascam brand deck, you may have issues, and that's because the tolerances were so tiny for these decks that um, things may not be exactly the same from one deck to another, and um, and things get out of whack uh, quickly. You'll talk more about uh, what kind of issues you may encounter in the audio in the next webinar. But uh, the classic uh, digital audio program um, was that, sorry, I'm reading the, the chat and I'm getting distracted. But um, the important thing for, for um, the, the, the classic sounds that you hear from when digital audio goes wrong are glitches, which sounds ugly, it sounds like a burst of noise, and uh, dropouts, which means there's literally no sound. Uh, digital audio has a bunch of uh, what's called error correction and error concealment circuits that can kind of re recreate the data if data is lost in something like a DAT, even a tiny wrinkle may have uh, kind of dire consequences. But um, sometimes uh, the circuits within the deck are built in with certain um, kind of uh, redundance. Um, then the redundance can take care of it. There's always a redundancy in digital audio. But sometimes there's enough, and sometimes there isn't. OK, someone asked me what CDDA stands for. We're going to talk more about uh, uh, CDs in a second, in fact, in the next slide. Um, and then. The difference between that and RDAT is none. Uh, that was what people called it, and RDAT is the kind of the complete, the complete, um, um, the complete name as as it was issued. Um, in archives, you will find that's in uh, broadcasting archives, also very popular in oral histories because all of a sudden you could have much much higher fidelity than an analog cassette and in also in field recording collections. So anything that needed a portable and high quality um, system, you will find uh, DATS. And uh, of course, it's an obsolete format. And, uh, and one thing someone mentions, yeah, just you could have extra metadata in these formats, almost all of them. You could, uh, you could have extra metadata. And we'll talk about that more in, when we talk about when we talk about metadata. Um, 
I don't know what ECC stands for, did that or so that did or didn't have, that's a great question, did that, uh, so that did or didn't have, oh the error correction, yes, they absolutely all have error correction, um, yes, they have error correction. And um, one thing that that was infamous for when it tries to become uh, a uh, consumer format was serial copy management system and that uh, was called in professional circles scums because it was not very well liked. And what that meant was that um, it had a system basically where you couldn't make a perfect digital copy of a DAT tape uh, more than one generation. That was when the industry was very, I guess the industry has never ceased to be very concerned about piracy. Um, but actually, this comes, brings up a good, a good point, which is with digital audio, if all goes well, there is no generation loss. So you can actually copy something exactly as it was. In fact, and this is kind of hard to comprehend, um, because of error correction, you can have uh, what is called cleaned up data. So the copy may actually be better than the original. If the, if the medium in which that um, data is uh, compromised in a way, your copy may actually be better than the original, which kind of is uh, a mind twist, but um, there you have it. All right, so let's talk about compact disc. Again, the archetypal um, digital audio format. It was announced in October 1982. Data is recorded by um, tiny little molds, uh, molded pits, sorry, not mold, although there are, there's mold that attacks uh, the, the CDs. Uh, tiny molded pits, so tiny little holes in a polycarbonate layer so a clear layer that's then covered in silver or aluminum and that becomes a refle reflective. It's read by laser and the, the laser reads um, those uh, differences in reflection as, uh, as data. Not necessarily zeros and ones, it's not as simple as that. And that doesn't mean that you know what's called lands and pits, one is zeros in which is um, one is zeros and one is ones. Uh, or lands is, is zeros and pits is ones, it's not exactly like that. It actually, um, because uh, it's more efficient, it reads the changes of state, if you wish. Um, it reads, and, but you don't need to concern yourself too much. That's going really deep into how a compact disc works. Um, but um, yeah, it's read by laser, in fact, three lasers, and it uses you know, various uh, complicated ways to, to read the data. So compact disc, the, the specification CDDA was again issued in 1982 and then there were, uh, D, uh, there were additions in 1984, 88 and 96 for CD-ROM, for CD-write-only and CD-RW. CDDA, the original one, which um, you may have heard of as Redbook, is an encoding standard. It actually describes the physical um, CD as well, but it describes how the sound is recorded in, in the CD. And then uh, CD write only, which was when CD art started becoming popular, and CD RW defined more the physical makeup. Okay, and the next slide will explain this a little more in detail. Uh, Julian asks, the way in which the data is represented in every copy can be different. Uh, well, it shouldn't be. Uh, if the copy, if the copy is correct, you, you have to think of digital data of any of any kind as kind of being an extra abstraction, okay? And that'll come a little more clear when we talk about encoding. But um, it should be exactly the same. The data as data um, should be exactly the same. So um, these various editions were specified in what's called the rainbow books because they were um, set forth in a set of uh, books that were different colors. The books, uh, if you're interested in getting one of them, are, they're very expensive, they're in the thousands of dollars, and, uh, but you can get them. And uh, uh, yeah, but these are, these are the, the various types. As archivists, it's important to, to realize this. The CDDA, has uh, has the data physically engraved 
in the polycarbonate layer. Whereas the data layer of a CD write once, which we normally call CDR, but the spec is CD write once, is an organic dye. So it's a totally different process in which physically the layer is, um, uh, works. It's an organic dye which if you apply a strong enough laser literally burns the dye and, and there's, there's places in the dye which are kind of uh, clear and ones that are burnt, that are opaque. Uh, it's not exactly like that but uh, it kind of works that. Um, and uh, so that's a totally different way of, of the physical makeup is totally different. And moreover, the data layer of a CDRW, a rewritable disk, is a what's called a phase changing film. And the phase changing film uses uh, a material that has a certain property to become crystalline or amorphous depending on the temperature at which is cooled and um, and it can be erased and rewritten several times. CDRWs are very uncommon because CDRs became so cheap that uh, CDRWs were not uh, practical anymore really. Um, it, was, it made no sense to try to rewrite your, your old data. Um, again, as, as archivists it's important to realize that a CDDA, a, a pre-recorded compact disc, is uh, a different and in fact much longer lasting than a CDR or a CDRW. What happens is that the dye, the dye dies, I would say, the organic dye uh, eventually becomes unreliable and the data can no longer be uh, read, particularly in, in kind of cheapo CDs. CDRs, um, that's, that's a problem. Um, we've had issues with longevity for um, CDRs that are as, as young as, as six or seven years where literally there's no data that can be read by the computer. So if your collection has CDRs, uh, please take a good hard look at it because they're not reliable. They were never meant to be archival um, materials no matter what the manufacturers told us and uh, indeed they've proven not to be okay so beware of the CDRs and definitely CDRW. CDRWs are even worse but again they're, they're kind of rare. Um, it used to be that you could uh, flip a CDR over and know the quality of the dye and the, and the metallic layer but of course manufacturers got smart and now they add additional dyes just to give color and give gold color or whatever color they want to the <laughs> to the CDs and uh, to the CDRs. So um, you know we can't do that anymore. Okay, so that's it for CDRs and compact disc in general. Copy question was really for R. Dad. Oh yeah, I think. Um, CDRW on digitizing, I would never use a CDRW as, okay, let me, let me answer the first question or the previous question uh, first. Okay, oh, if you copy, okay, this is, it can get philosophical, but if you copy audio from an RDAT to say a, um, a your computer, right? If you know a medium is um, in danger and you copy the audio to a computer, any copy, any transformation, and this I'm talking about general archival practice, is a transformation. What I mean to say is that the data is never exactly the same. So there are compromises. Yes, that's, uh, that tapes have uh, additional metadata that you may not capture. If that is of ultimate importance, uh, you're going to have to think of diff a different way um, to save that audio if your access is different. I, I compare usually to um, uh, a text, right? So you have text that is in English, um, or let's say, since I'm, I'm calling from here, um, I will say, um, 
Don Quixote of my Cervantes, right? If you're interested in reading the novel, uh, you can, uh, if, and you don't know Spanish, you're going to have to read it in English. You're going to have to accept that. There will be some changes. But the, if the option is reading it versus not reading it, I would recommend to you read it, right? It's, it's a great book. So there's always, the moment you, you move, and I'm not even going to forensics. If we go into forensics, that's a whole other um, extra layer of, of authenticity that I'm not even addressing. But there's always a transformation. There's, it's never the same. Um, and that's uh, why sometimes I have a little problem when people talk about, oh, this, this has been preserved. If you copy a data onto your, um, onto your hard drive, presumably the most important part of that data has been preserved. And uh, just as you, know, you, can, you can access it, people can access it more easily. And if the original Don Quixote is falling apart, thank goodness that someone has printed millions and millions of copies of it. So um, I don't mean to diminish the, the process of copying digitally to something, but um, you're always losing a little bit of, of the essence of, of the, that's a bad word because people use it in a different way, um, of what that format was about. And that applies for all, all formats, I think. Okay, I hope that answers your question. And uh, the next question was, oh, I would never ever use CDRW as the best optical media storage option. Make sure that they're saying that because that sounds kind of weird. Uh, no, it's, it's not unique to audio data. Archival quality CDRs, again, uh, buyer beware. I would, at this point, would not use CDRs as an archival medium at all, okay? That's what uh, YASA recommends, and meaning that YASA recommends not to use CDRs, and in fact has been saying it for many years. YASA is an uh, international organization of audiovisual archives, um, that it's um, a bunch of very smart people, and um, yeah, I would never use CDRs for backups. Um, or you may use them as an additional, um, safety layer, if you will, if in case, you know, the power grid for the entire continent one day goes down and all your servers die or something, or there's a big storm or a flood, um, but uh, CDRs have not proven to be uh, reliable. So definitely buyer beware. And definitely buyer beware, that should go for any uh, manufacturer claims that are not backed up by an independent organization. Um, we've all seen, I think, certain manufacturers that claim uh, lifetimes of hundreds or hundred years. Not true. Okay, uh, I don't want to get too far behind, so we're going to talk about Minidisc, um, which was announced in 1991. It uses um, the property of certain materials to become magnetic at certain temperatures, so it's, a, uh, it's magnetic storage, but it's actually read by a laser, so it's very much a hybrid system in the sense that um, the materials get heated up, then material with, uh, with, uh, within is, um, is magnetized, but then it's read by a laser, so it's generally bunched with um, compact disc as an optical, um, optical uh, medium. The, even the way the audio is, uh, is stored inside is almost file-based. It's almost like a, like a hard drive in a way. It was kind of a primitive hard drive, somewhere between a CD and a hard drive. And it uses 8-track data reduction, which we'll talk about uh, later. Or we'll talk about data reduction. It's a type of proprietary sound um, uh, data reduction from Sony. And uh, it has several resolutions. Um, later it became full resolution, so you can have a Sony um, Sorry, a, a mini disc of any brand that will be full uh, resolution. Uh, it's common in broadcasting, oral history, and dance archives. Dancers love the uh, random um, access uh, file structure because they can, uh, for example, could take away eight um, eight bars in the middle of a piece if they decided not to do that part of the piece. I know because I used to work uh, in theaters and dancers many times. Dance companies many times bring. Um, uh, mini discs. It's obsolete as of 2013. 2013 was the last time a uh, uh, mini disc player was manufactured. Seems like the data uh, 
my experience of the data is fairly robust, but um, you know, it's an obsolete format, so um, again, buyer beware. Okay, that concludes our overview of uh, file-based digital audio systems. And now we're going to talk about uh, file-based audio. So again, even though file-based audio lives in a physical format, the, the role that the carriers like a CD or a Minidisc um, play are uh, the files. The files are the ones that, um, that are kind of like the, the container of the, with the container for the audio. So it's an extra layer, if you will. Okay? There's many, I mean, you can always look at more and more layers, but that's, I think, a good, um, a good conceptual framework to think about file-based audio. There's an extra layer uh, within your hard drive, basically. Um, we're going to talk about WAV files and MP3s in a little more detail, but you should be aware there's many others. Um, in many software, if you, you know, if you receive a hard drive, there's software that can tell you, okay, uh, find me all the uh, all the audio. I think even um, the Mac operating system can tell you all the audio that can it can recognize as audio files. Many others, like I said, AI, AIFF audio interchange file format, that's kind of like the equivalent uh, way for Macs, so we're not going to talk about it, not because I have anything about Macs, quite the contrary, uh, but um, they're very similar in structure to, to WAV files. And um, there's Sound Designer and Sound Designer 2, these are files that are used usually in professional circles because they're the files that um, the Pro Tools system uses and they have the extension SD, SD2, or L, or R, um, and we can go into detail about that if you want, but uh, for now, suffice to say that you find files with those, usually within a Mac environment, they, they may be sound files. There's MPEG part, uh, 4 part 14, which are, uh, whose extension is MP4. There's Oct Vorbis, OGG, with the uh, um, extension OGG. And uh, there's real audio, more rare these days, but definitely in archives they can pop up uh, with extension R RA or RM. There's window me Windows Media, WMA, there's MXF, there's DDP, uh, there's ISO. There's a bunch of uh, file formats, uh, some of which are more obsolete than others. Um, real audio, for example, we found, here's a, an example of a hybrid thing a bunch of CDRs that someone had burned a while back in, the, in our archive with real audio uh, files. And I had a bit of trouble finding software that would play them back. Um, I'm not talking about great trouble, but you know, it's an obsolete, uh, you can think of it, again, this is where it, it becomes um, useful. You can think of it as, a, as uh, my computer doesn't have the right instructions to read um, to read the uh, the files, uh, Eve asks. Sound designer is coming from the Mac world. Yes, originally Pro Tools uh, was a Mac only system, and that's why they can have extensions such as .l and .r because the Mac operating system, as you probably know, uh, creates or some of you may know, creates extra um, metadata. Actually, the operating system itself. Um, that allows basically for you to change file extensions. Um, it creates what's called sidecar files that allow the allow um, the operating system to know what kind of file it is. So yes, it comes from the Mac world. Now um, many many audio systems uh, and audio software within Windows can play um, sound designer files. But yeah, originally it was Mac. Okay, moving along, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the WAV file format. WAV file format was released in 1991 as part of the RIFF, which stands for Resource Interchange File Format. Another um, well-known uh, file for those in video is AVI, and um, so a WAV file is a type of RIFF file format. It was released in, by Microsoft and IBM. Generally has the .wav or .wav extension. 
is uh, one of the most popular um, types of, of way of recording uh, audio, particularly as a um, full resolution um, fi file format. And the characteristic of the WAV file format is that data is structured in what they call chunks. Um, and it has to have these two. Has to have a, a WAV file has to have format chunk, which kind of sends the flag to the software that this is a WAV file, and WAV data, um, usually linear PCM, but not necessarily. And um, and then there's other optional chunks which may or may not be there. What happens when there's a format like this that this that, that's announced? Um, they leave extra space in the in the specification for other uh, for other organizations to develop uses for these additional spaces. And in fact, that's what happened five years later in 1996. The European Broadcast Union came up with the BWF extension, the Broadcast Wave File extension, which includes additional chunks. Of particular interest to archivists is the BEXT chunk, which um, can have descriptive metadata such as description, originator, etc. And um, what that means is that, that those descriptions live within the WAV file itself. It's still a WAV extension, the BWF extension, so if a software cannot read that, um, that uh, chunk, it'll just skip it, but it should play it. And um, it's worth noting that the BWF extension is the preferred archival format for 48,016 um, linear PCM audio. Um, Dimitrios asks, is WAVE uncompressed or more so than other fa formats? Depends. <laughs> Generally, it's um, not compressed or data reduced at all, but it can. It actually can. Uh, WAVE, again, is a wrapper. And then within that wrapper, it actually has quite a bit of flexibility. So um, you can actually have something encoded as an MPEG layer 3 um, within a WAVE file. Rare, I will tell you that it's a very rare thing. I don't know if I've ever seen one, but it can happen. Um, another um, addition in 2006, also from the European Broadcasting Union, Union is the RF64. And this is for files that are bigger than um, four gigabytes. And, um, and these are not necessarily always backwards compatible. This, we got, for example, a collection back from uh, a high resolution um, files that were the files, some of them were bigger than four gigabytes and we had issues with them. The RF64 is a bit of a, I, I think of it as a bit of a risky proposition, but of course if you have something that's more than four gigabytes, uh, you don't have many options. Um, and I will say also that a software like BWF Meta Edit is uh, useful to um, inspect the BEXT chunk with additional metadata. Um, the preservation issues of, the, of something like a WAV file are mostly related to, again, fragility of carrier. If you have it in one, only in one um, hard drive, hard drives crash, an average of seven years um, you know, is the mean uh, time uh, for crashes of hard drives, so that's an issue. And, um, and not so much for WAV files, but the software needs to, when you think on long term, we hope there will be software um, available to play it back. Those are the, the, the issues that you may have as, as WAV files uh, in the future. But so far, they're very, very well supported. In fact, the format is, is well documented and open. Um, Brenda asks what 4816 linear PCM means. It's going to um, become um, apparent in the next few slides. But that refers to um, how the audio is encoded and the resolution, 48K, I should have put, and 16-bit uh, linear PCM. OK. Now that we've covered uh, WAV format, we're going to talk about the MP3 format when we talk about uh, and, um, uh, data reduction and um, encoding in the coding section. So we're going to talk about encoding. So you, um, I mentioned that I'm not too far from the Mediterranean. So imagine I want to uh, record how the tides work, um, how high they are in my, my neck of the woods, or my neck of the ocean. And um, 
and I want to register them. I could put a buoy on top of the of the um, C and attach a marker, maybe a sharpie or something next to a board, and uh, maybe that board have some kind of rotating uh, thing, so I could see how the waves go. Uh, sorry, the tides go up and down. But I could also decide if I wanted to. Um, tell you, someone on the East Coast, hey, this is how they're different, uh, the tides in the Mediterranean versus the Atlantic, how um, I could take data in discrete steps. And the two basic questions I'm going to have, the two basic decisions are how often should I tell you uh, or with what kind of ruler, what kind of ruler I should use. In audio sampling, it's very much that way. And the two main um, parameters are quantization level and sampling rate. Quantization level refers to how fine um, those divisions are when I, uh, when I take the measurements. And it's often expressed as bit depth. And, uh, and that means 2 to the x of amplitude levels. For example, if I say it's 16 bit, it's 2 to the 16 or about um, for about 64,000 discrete levels. And then you have the sampling rate, which means how often am I taking that measurement. If I'm um, recording tides, then I definitely wanted them to be uh, at least four times as um, frequent as a day. You know, for, I, can, I want to divide the day at least in four times. And um, for example, a common sampling rate is 44,000 times, 44,100 per second. And the sampling theorem, which we're not going to get into now, says that it has to be two times uh, the sampling, the highest uh, vibrating object that you're, you're listening. Uh, in general, audio can be heard between 20 and 20,000. And uh, uh, that means we have to sample it at least theoretically at 40,000 times a second. And that's a mathematical uh, aspect. Here are some common frequencies, uh, sampling frequencies and quantitation levels for CD, uh, standard CD audio, 44.1, 16 bit. For certain types of DAT, this is not the normal one, 48.24. And for very high definition uh, audio, we mentioned for uh, archival audio, for example, of analog materials, uh, 96 and 24 bit uh, uh, resolution. Okay, so that's once you have this as, uh, as data, the engineering challenge is how to capture and transmit that sound as faithfully as possible with the least amount of data. So these are some ways that people, have, the engineers have come up with. We have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to uh, go a little faster uh, for the next steps. But uh, suffice to say, we're going to talk about linear PCM and MPEG layer 3. Uh, but there's others. There's DSD, which stands for Direct Stream Digital, digital which among audio files is becoming popular. Um, those are linear types, which means that you're kind of doing it exactly as you expect it to be. You, you capture this data and you present it exactly the same way. Um, then there's lossless, which means it uses a bit as of a compression uh, system, data reduction system, but then can re-enact uh, the entire data set, a bit like a zip file. So you, you have a Word document, you put it in a zip file, and then it's unzipped and the Word document is there wholly. And there, there's the lossy systems would use uh, kind of trickery to fool you into thinking you're hearing the, the real audio, the complete audio, but in fact, you're not. MP3 is the most uh, famous one, but there's also ASC developed by Apple. And there's A-Track, which we mentioned for Sony. And um, WMA, uh, WMA9 is another. And there's, these are all basically mathematical uh, uh, systems. We'll talk about linear PCM, which is the most common by far for full resolution audio, developed in 1937, pretty incredible. Uh, it's the most common encoding. Linear refers, I'm actually, uh, even though we put it in linear, uh, as, as a linear codec, linear originally meant, um, this slide is um, wrong, <laughs> it refers to the, the fact that the, the ruler is divided equally. There's um, reasons to not do that if you want to, um, save data, but in case in this case, it means that the ruler is divided equally, and um, but also in our case, it means that there's no perceptual coding. Modulation is just means a, a means of encoding information, 
and in this case the, the values, the discrete values are stored as pulses. You may be uh, familiar if you listen to terrestrial radio to, with AM or FM uh, uh, amplitude modulation or frequency modulation. Okay, MPEG layer 3 is uh, most commonly seen in um, MP3 files and it was issued in 1993 by the Fraunhofer Institute and what it does is it uses perceptual coding in this case psychoacoustic masking what that means is that it fools you into thinking oh you're never going to hear this part of the sound after you know listening and doing a lot of tests and um, they can fool you into not thinking or not caring so much so an mp3 um, format may have maybe the tenth of the size of a WAV file and sound not that much worse. Uh, so it's a pretty amazing um, encoding standard, but of course uh, it's not archivally uh, proper because it, you're getting rid of data. Let's talk about metadata a little bit. Um, when you think about physical formats, there's external, attached, and embedded. So in other words, uh, well, well, we'll go into that. And when we talk about, about file-based, we'll talk about external, sidecar, and embedded. Um, for physical formats, an external way of attaching metadata to your audio may be with databases or card catalogs and may have descriptive or technical information. Something that's a little closer is something that's supposed to live with the audio, maybe labels, J cards, boxes, and again, may have technical or description metadata. And then there's embedded metadata. Uh, someone mentioned IDs and flags or time codes, and that's definitely uh, compact disc also can have that. They can also have CD text. Um, many of those are designed to be read by the machine. Sometimes displayed, sometimes not. The schemas for those are internally defined uh, for embedded, so they need to be very strict because they need to be machine readable. And then anything not embedded, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, similarly, for file-based formats, there's you know, external databases or card catalogs which can have anything. There's something called side card files, which are files that are supposed to kind of live together with your audio file. Uh, things like DDP text files or uh, processes such as Bagot and Mets that wrap things in additional folders and there's folders that are supposed to live with a file. And then there's embedded and that's when we think of metadata, data, usually we think of embedded uh, uh, data. In the case of WAV files, for example, there's the RIF chunks that we mentioned, the, the broadcast WAV files uh, BEX chunk, but there's other chunks such as the AES card, AXML, IXML, XMP. Uh, this is for the RIF chunks, uh, usually with, within a WAV file. And then there's um, ID3, which usually lives in MP3 um, uh, file formats, and those are read by um, those are read by something like, uh, for example, iTunes or, or others. And uh, Pro Tools, Agorvis has its own header. Each file uh, system can have uh, its own. But again, very similar to how the physical way world, uh, world works, um, the schemas are very strictly defined for embedded. So in other words, the manufacturers have to agree on something that can be uh, read by different uh, types of manufacturers. Slightly looser for sidecards, something like METS is well defined, so you have to be a little more careful how you uh, encode that metadata. And then anything goes for external, um, you know. And some of the schemas that are, that are popular are doubling in audio are doubling core, which is not necessarily audio, but IPTC, um, EBU SEMT dictionary, for example, PB core is another one, ID3 also has its own uh, set of metadata. Useful software for embedded metadata, I'll mention three here uh, that I think are all free. BWF Meta Edit, Media Info, and FFmpeg are the, the three that we use uh, very often as archivists. And they allow you to dig a little deeper. Some software will um, allow you to go into some of these metadata um, uh, fields, but uh, these are pretty complete. I'm going to mention these uh, four resources. Ken Pullman, Principles of Digital Audio is like the Bible of Digital Audio. TCO4 from Yasa, which I think Kim uh, gave you the, the link. Uh, Mastering Audio is a bit more uh, technical, 
for mastering engineers, but it asks actually some good explanations of some of the technical issues. And then I want to uh, mention that the, my um, uh, my analogy with the with the tides of of the ocean actually come from this book, which is also has a lot of other things about audio. So those are good um, things to have. Here are some upcoming webinars. Audio workflow will tell you how to deal with these formats that we talked about. And then we go into the video world, digital video formats, video workflows, and uh, digital formats and infrastructure. OK, we have very few questions, um, uh, very few time, uh, very little time for question. Hopefully, I've addressed all of them. Uh, I will mention that is the volume of an audio defined by quantization level? Not exactly. It's almost like the precision with which you can uh, define that uh, volume of audio is defined by the quantization level. If you think of a volume, a stepped volume level on your stereo, um, it doesn't mean that, and one that doesn't have those steps, it doesn't mean that one uh, is can be louder than the other necessarily, but it means like, oh, I can make it just a little louder, or I can make it considerably louder in just one step. I hope that, that makes sense. Any other question? Can you explain the difference between synchronous and asynchronous? Yes. In um, synchronous um, storage and retrieval, the speed at which the file is accessed is the speed at which uh, the file is uh, listened to, basically. And in asynchronous, the file is ingested as a whole thing and then spit out at the correct speed. Um, so like I said, we talked about the tape. The tape is running across the head. And as it's running across the head, the audio is being played. Um, and I cannot access it forward or backwards. Whereas um, the same with a classic CD player. You can fast forward a little bit, but you cannot uh, know uh, what, what the audio sounds like. You know. 20 minutes later without listening to it. OK, how, where is the information in the file about how loud it is? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, that will be, um, the file is as loud as it needs to be, I guess. That's my, my, my question. About the volume of the file, you can run statistics on, on a file and see if that's what you're asking. Uh, about how file, how loud a file is, and in fact, you can store that in the metadata. Um, broadcasters use that often, but um, the the quantization level would not necessarily again uh, tell you how loud the, the file is. You can tell you how finely uh, divided that volume level can be. Think of it as as if you have a level of 100, right? The level of 100 can be divided into two, right? Loud or not loud, or you can divide it into a million, and and uh, and that could tell you exactly how you, you could have a much more, much finer, much more subtle way to um, to uh, define or to describe that volume. I hope that makes sense. Think of the tides. Think of the tides, and if I want to really be um, Careful, of course, the ruler has to has to um, accept the entire range of the tide. But if I want to just capture the tides, I don't want to get the ripples. Uh, then having a ruler in millimeters would probably not be very useful. But having a ruler that only measures uh, meters may be too coarse to to define that tide properly. But the fact that the the ruler is 20 feet or 5 feet kind of has nothing to do with the quantization level. I hope that explains it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Marcos. That was such a great lecture. And um, I want to give folks an opportunity, if anyone else has any additional questions, they can type them in the chat window or follow up via, Mar uh, via email to Marcos. Um, 
and I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this has been the second of EMEA webinars, and we have our third coming up on Tuesday. It also deals with audio, uh, looking at audio workflows, and we will be joined by Alex Crow for that session on Tuesday, September 22nd. So thanks to everyone for joining us today. This session will has been recorded, and a link to both the recording um, as well as the presentation PDF will be distributed soon after the session. So just keep an eye out in your inboxes. Thanks so much to everyone for, for joining us, and we would love to hear your feedback. So um, you will also receive an evaluation via the, uh, from the EMEA office. So um, any ideas you have for future sessions for the EMEA Continuing Education uh, Task Force, we would love to hear from you. Thanks again, Marcos. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care.